This is part 9 of the Facet N4000 paper tape punch restoration. At the end of the last video I said that I wouldn't be making any more videos on this um, punch unless I resolved the last problem I was having, which if you did see the videos you'll know that the problem I have is whenever I try to access the keyboard following a power up I get this pass um, message popping up which I assumed was the prompt expecting me to enter a passcode. I have no idea what the passcode was and uh, the seller had no idea what the passcode was. I can't find any information about this in any of the manuals I've been able to find. So I did find a workaround which I showed in a previous video and that workaround was to force the machine into an error at which point I could partially bypass the passcode but it's not a complete solution and I'll, I'll demonstrate why that is so firstly I'll force this into an error so we can see what state it ends up in okay so as you can see I've got this into an error state I'll do that by making it think the paper's over tight and once I'm in this error state I can press the exit key and this will at least allow me to go into the programming mode I can then set the parameters as to what I want and unfortunately it will revert back to the um, online state whenever I try to do anything else from the keyboard and that's fine for most of what I will be using this for which is reproducing tapes or reading tapes but if I wanted to use this machine to its full capability really I need to fully unlock the keyboard and the issue here is I may want to copy a tape or do something similar but in this state where I forced it past the password by inducing an error whenever I try and access any of the high level functions I get this busy signal which according to the manual says that um, it means there's data in the buffer it hasn't yet printed there's no way around this other than to go back to line mode but the problem I do that is when I then try to access anything else the keys don't work again and it's expecting me to enter uh, a passcode so as you can see it's not a, a complete workaround so what I decided to do then and I'll reposition the camera now so that you can see um, where I ended up at the end of the last video so as you can see what I've been doing is reverse engineering the firmware I've been hooking this to the logic analyzer so I've hooked up the uh, main processor and the external SRAM chip this is the SRAM that holds the non-volatile data I'd assumed that um, the non-volatile settings including the passcode would be installed in this chip I'd already tried removing the battery to let it um, lose its contents but it just came back with the same settings so I'm assuming there's a mechanism within the uh, firmware for putting in place the default passcode but again I can't find any reference to this in the manuals so what I decided to do was to try trapping various locations within the external um, SRAM to see if I could find what the passcode might be but this didn't go quite the way I'd expected it to this is really the purpose of this video is to show that there's sometimes more than one way to resolve issues with these old pieces of equipment uh, but before I go into that in more detail I'll just show you on the analyzer screen what I was doing up to this point so again I'll reposition the camera so you can see the analyzer screen okay so we're monitoring the um, address bus of the RAM chip this is not the address bus from the processor this is the address bus uh, as it enters the SRAM so I was looking at several things firstly the uh, basic address so I was looking at specific addresses but I was also looking at ranges of addresses so looking at where the uh, chip was mapped to and I got that based on the mode that the processor was being started uh, up in if you want to know how I did that then you can watch the previous video where I go into details as to how I determine the mode that the processor was running in and if you haven't seen that video it's an MC68701 which is essentially an MC 
6801 but with internal RAM and EEPROM. So if we look at the waveform, what I was doing was setting the trigger such that when I entered the password entry function, I was triggering the analyzer. So I'll just enter that now. I'm going into the password uh, entry screen on the punch. And as you can see, that's allowed me to capture that particular event. I could then work my way through the code and the analyzer is also monitoring the RAM chip select line. So whenever that line goes low, I know it's reading a value from the RAM. So I could go through and see what values it was reading through the RAM in response to entering the password entry. And my thinking was that, well, at some point it's going to read the values from RAM that constitute the passcode. Unfortunately, that's uh, not how it seems to work. I spent several hours doing this and didn't really get any closer to a solution. So I think what's actually happening is when the contents of the RAM are lost, a value that's actually in the 68701 EEPROM is copied into RAM. And unfortunately, I don't have a reader for an MC68701. They are available, but they're quite expensive. But from what I can gather, you also need specialist uh, add-on modules to be able to read uh, an MC68701 because you need to kind of almost run code in order to configure it such that you can access the internal EEPROM. So I could have gone down that route and got a, a reader, or I could have maybe made one, but it was looking like it was going to get expensive and very time consuming. So I had a bit of a sit and a think about it and decided that I'd take a different approach that I've done on several previous occasions with bits of equipment that I needed a passcode for. And I thought I'd show you what the solution was I'd come up with and whether or not it would actually work to give me the passcode. So I'll just reposition the camera again and show you what uh, I'd come up with. Okay, so I've uh, disconnected the analyzer and this is the device I put together in order to try and figure out what the passcode was. Now, I decided that although I could probably continue trying to reverse engineer the firmware, it was going to be very difficult because there's no real way to sensibly read the EEPROM in the main processor which means that you can't see the internal bus cycles within the processor, so I can't capture them on the logic analyzer. I can only capture the signals that come out of the device. And then I'd have to try to figure out what was going on internally. That would be very time consuming and long-winded. So as I say, I'll put this together. What it does is it guesses incrementally all the possible combinations of the password. So essentially what it does, it simulates pressing keys on the keyboard. It started, or I set it to start at a value of uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, working on the assumption that there was a uh, four-digit code. And I'll quickly uh, demonstrate it so you can see how it works. But uh, basically you have a, um, an LED at the bottom here for each of the digits, 0 through to 9, and then two more LEDs for the two non-digit keys. And the way that the code seemed to be entered, as I said, I wasn't quite sure because I don't have a manual for this. It seems that what you do to enter the code is to press five, um, then the star key, that will give you a blank display. And then as you enter digits, you'll get a dash for each digit. Uh, so I assume there were four digits required for the code. And then once you've entered the code, I assumed you press the star key again simply because that's the way all other parameters seem to be entered according to the user manual. Although as I say the user manual doesn't mention this passcode at all so it might be specific to this version of firmware. So once it's going uh, through the guesses it's also monitoring one of the lines on the punch stepper drive. Again I figured that once it goes into this code and it gets the correct code it's going to feed out a leader because that's how I've configured the um, settings. Um, but again that was kind of just speculation, I didn't know if that was going to work or not. Now what I've done here is slowed it down to a tenth of the speed I had it running at simply so you can see what it's doing. It's set to start guessing as soon as I turn the power on. So I'll do that now. 
So as you can see, what it's doing is simulating key presses and it's looking at each individual possible combination in turn, entering it and seeing if that results in a, a pass or a fail. If it fails, it carries on to the next value and if it gets a hit, then it will know what the hit is and it will then just continually cycle around the same code on the uh, LEDs. Like I said, I've actually configured this and changed the firmware in the processor a little bit just so it starts um, about 50 or 60 values before the actual code uh, just so you can see what happens when it finds the code. And it's about a minute and a half from the point where we started before it should hit on the correct um, passcode. And obviously once I've got the correct passcode then I can just use that to go in and set a new passcode or at least then I know what the default passcode is and that will then allow me to enter the uh, the system through the keyboard and in theory it should also let me access all the high level functions that I couldn't get to before. So we'll just let it uh, continue running and we shouldn't be too far away now from it hitting on the correct code. Okay, so I'll disconnect that so it's not going to distract us. We can see now that we are into the system. And what I did then is look at the uh, value it had reached when it um, managed to get into the system. It turns out that the digits are in different order in the way that they're stored, so the passcode that you enter is not the one stored within memory. Uh, but even so, just looking at the way that um, they could be used and what I had already discovered through the reverse engineering I'd already done, um, I then could figure out what the passcode was. So now with this removed, this is not running anymore, I'll turn off the punch. So power up the punch. It goes back into the normal mode that it's uh, always been coming up into. Uh, but what I can now do, of course, is enter the passcode. So whereas before I didn't have the passcode to enter, I can now enter that and it takes me into the system and I can now access uh, not only the settings but I can also access the higher level functions that I couldn't get to before. In other words, I now have full access to the machine. I know what the passcode is uh, and all it took was uh, about an hour and a half to build this, about half an hour to write some code, 10 minutes to hook up the wires and I now have um, full access to the punch. So that's the last issue resolved. Uh, other than a few cosmetic things that I need to take care of. So I'll get this reassembled, uh, get back on camera, and then hopefully show the punch uh, fully up and running. And we have full access to the system. So not only can I now run it from the line, from the terminal program, but if I want to do a direct copy from uh, tape to tape, I can just install a tape, select copy, Press start. And we now have an exact copy of the tape. So if I just overlay these. So you can see it is an exact copy. And it's uh, fast. I can speed this up. It's set to read 200 characters a second at the moment but that can be changed to 500. Um, had to make a chat box, the one uh, that uh, should be there was missing. But uh, all I need to do now is give it a few uh, final touches, reinstall the sand ending foam which I've got, and then have a plastic cover made up for the, uh, the tape. And then uh, that's this machine fully restored and ready to be put into use. Hope you found that interesting. If there's any particular questions you want on this, then please uh, drop me a comment.